Hello, everyone. Welcome to our weekly discussion series um, that is hosted by the Chaldean Cultural Center. I hope that everybody had a wonderful Christmas and New Year. Um, and uh, this segment, uh, as all our segments, it's uh, in collaboration with Un University of Michigan Detroit um, chapter, Unique Voices in Films and CMN TV. And today we have a special guest who has done incredible, incredible work in preserving the RMA language, uh, Professor Jeffrey Kahn um, of uh, Cambridge University is here with us. And uh, welcome, Professor. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Ria. Delighted to be here. Well, I first was introduced to Dr. Jeffrey Kahn when we were working, working earlier in 2019 um, on a project to help preserve the Aramaic language. And I found enormous uh, information that he had provided, including articles. And I learned um, through this process that you've been very involved in this for over 20 years now. So can you share your background on how you got involved in this journey? Well, I, I was born in north of England, a place called Middlesbrough, uh, and I, uh, as a teenager, I was very fascinated by languages in general. Um, and my, I, I come from a very medical background. My father and my uncle were trying to encourage me to go into medicine, but I had my heart set on studying languages. So... Um, they used to say to me, you know, to study medicine is important to save lives and things like that. And But I followed my heart in the end at 18 and I went to study Semitic languages at the University of London. That means languages like Arabic, Hebrew, Aramaic, Akkadian. There's a sort of family of Semitic. Um, but these were ancient languages, essentially. I mean, the, the, those are the languages I, I studied. So I did a PhD in the University of London on some ancient Semitic languages, on the sort of linguistic structure of ancient Semitic languages. But then shortly after that, I, I met some Aramaic-speaking Christians in London, um, from actually from Karakosh. They were from uh, a village, well, you all know Karakosh, of course, Bagdebe, as they call it. Um, and uh, the, these were the community of, of, from Berdebe in, um, in London. Um, and that really kind of changed my life because I suddenly realized I, in front of me was uh, speakers of an ancient language you know, whose roots go back to antiquity, um, you know, whose language has really been almost unknown to scholarship. I mean, if you studied university, you would be studying these ancient classical languages, such as ancient Syriac, for example, or ancient, other forms of ancient Aramaic. But here in front of me was speak, living speakers of living language. And uh, then, you know, I started to investigate these languages and I saw how, first of all, of course, I learned all about the tragic history of the speakers of Aramaic. Uh, and um, since essentially the First World War, over a hundred years of, of, of upheavals. And uh, this was, of course, when I started working, this was before Islamic State had come onto the scene, but that, that still we had the NFL campaigns in Iraq and things like that, all, which had displa displaced so many uh, communities. But then I, I saw how incredibly rich and diverse Aramaic is in terms of its spoken dialects because it's important to recognize how how many dialects there are. There are over a hundred dialects of Aramaic spoken in Iraq, Western Iran and, and used to be spoken in southeastern Turkey. Now the that diversity show it's a reflection of the antiquity of, of, of these spoken dialects. Um, because when you get a lot of dialectal diversity, it shows that the language has been there for hundreds of years. And I like to compare it to English dialects. If you come to England, you know, the different regions have a, have a different dialects. I mean, they're beginning to sort of get leveled a bit now, but certainly some years ago, there was multiple dialects. Whereas in the United States, I mean, 
it's essentially uniform English. I mean, there's okay, there's a different pronunciations if you're in Texas, you speak rather different from right. It's just <laughs> mostly like an accent that's different, right. not the words. Yes, but you see, in Iraq, for example, uh, there are there's, there's a vast amount of dialectal diversity, and that is a reflection of antiquity, of, of, of the in antique, very deep roots. So I, what I, I've also discovered quite rapidly was that in fact these dialects were not direct descendants of the classical languages I'd studied. Like we talk about Syriacs, ancient Syriac or classical Syriac, the written form of language. Now, the dialects that the, uh, the Christians in Karakosh, for example, were speaking, or still speak to this day, or the um, Chedei are, uh, in fact, it's not direct descendant of Syriac. In fact, none of the spoken dialects of the Chaldeans or other Aramaic-speaking peoples in Iraq are direct descendants of Syriac, the, the literary language. They, are all, they all have a history of their own. And this history is very, very ancient, and it goes back all the way to uh, antiquity. So it, it's, and it's had this parallel history with the literary language, and it's only now surfacing, as it were, you know, in, in a sort of this, these, these vernaculars. And in some respects, you know, the, the, the spoken dialects are even more, you can say, typologically, that more ancient than these classical lang literary languages like the Chedidai, for example, have a, a form of dialect which has more ancient structures in it than Syriac. And um, it preserves all kinds of ancient words, you know, like words which go all the way back to Akkadian, for example, like, uh, like in, in Chedidai and also on, elsewhere in the Mosul Plain, you know, they have these words like Billa, you know, used for a door, outside door. Uh, mm -hmm. Now that is goes all the way back to Akkadian. It's, you know, Abulu in Akkadian. And the Hededai talk about, they have this sort of storeroom in a house and it's called Bachshime. And that goes back to an Akkadian word, Bit Hashimu. And uh, so I, you know, I, I, I saw the, how antique these, these Daleks are. But I also saw how endangered and how they are, in, in, and, and this is because of all the upheavals. And it, the fact is that, you know, so many of the communities have, have, have been forced out to, to migrate. And, um, and this has meant that a lot of the communities mix together, which, which can cause a loss of, of the dialect, but also they can cause, you know, the, the fact that they're displaced from their original culture, from their original way of life, has meant that a lot of the, certainly a lot of the words, a lot of the vocabulary of these dialects are being lost. For example, the, the words which are used in, in, uh, in traditional agriculture in, in the villages in Iraq, for example, uh, are simply forgotten because, I mean, if you come to America or England or whatever and you're living in a city, you're not going to use a plow or, I mean, the, these farmers, they would know the, all the names of all the parts of plough and, and they'd know all the names of the plants. And a lot of these are ancient words. I mean, um, I found um, Aramaic speaking Christians who were, who's, who were sowing rice, for example, up in the north of Iraq, in, in uh, this north of Ahmadi in a place called Barwa. Uh, um, but I also met in London and they, you know, they have a whole lot of words from Akkadian uh, relating to the cultivation of rice. And um, so I discovered that, you know, the, these dialects incredibly, some of them are very endangered. Uh, in fact, um, some of them are, have gone extinct. I mean, but, but, but most of them have got surviving speakers, but these speakers are very old now. These are usually speakers who, who are now, have, uh, have, have, have uh, still remember the ancient way of life. And um, it's also very important to note that in, in addition to the language with all its words, its, its full, rich vocabulary, there's also very, very ancient oral 
tradition of storytelling and ancient culture, oral culture, and that is being lost as well with the language. And, and, and this oral tradition is incredibly old and it was incredibly rich. So what I decided to do, I decided a long time ago, and about 25 years ago, I, I would start to try to to document as many of these dialects as I could to preserve them. And I, I, I felt I wanted to preserve them um, for, for various reasons. First of all, I felt this is something I could, I felt very strongly emotionally, I wanted to help the people who speak the language because I felt that they had undergone such suffering, you know, over the last hundred years and they, they, were, they were losing their culture. And, they were, this was causing, a, a, I could see how loss of a culture of which language is the kind of the core, loss of that, like, loss of your ancestral language is, is, can cause a, 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 a considerable trauma. I mean, nowadays, you know, humanitarian organizations tend to concentrate on loss of material property, you know, loss of homes and destruction, which is quite, you know, quite... quite you know, understandable, but I, I've learned over the years that a loss of a, a culture, a loss of a language can cause a great trauma as well. So it was been, it's been my mission to really act as a sort of a way to try to heal some of this trauma by, by preserving the, 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 the many dialects. So, I mean, that has been one of my strongest motivations as a way to sort of and I began to realize that, you know, my father and uncle used to say to me, you know, you need to become a doctor to do good to humanity. I, I, hope, I feel that you can do good to humanity in other ways. You can actually help tr heal cultural trauma. And, and I think that, that, that's, that's one of the, my motivations. But yeah, I have to say also, of course, I'm very interested as, a, as, an, as an academic in the language in a far more general way, because... It's important to know that these, these dialects are not, they're important not only to the communities. I mean, they're important to the communities for their cultural heritage and their, and their, their identity, but they're incredibly important for humanity in general because they, each dialect has something very unique about it. And, and each dialect is a sort of unique part of human language in general. So, you know, every time you lose a dialect of Aramaic, you lose a part of human language. And you, lo you lose a part of humanity because, again, as I said, the language is a core of humanity. I'm saying the core of human civilization, core of, core of human culture, I'd say. And so if you're losing every dialect of every language that gets lost, you lose a part of that, that human culture. So I think it's, one can't just simply say it's, a, it's only, a, you know, it's only a, a concern of, of communities of, who speak the that dialects, it's also important for you know for the a wider sort of humanity. So and 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 for the study of human language, because this is what I've been doing over the. A lot of my work has been involved with finding structures in these dialects, these, these details which are unique to to human language, and and showing helping us understand how human language in general works. So. Um, those are the, the some of the motivations I, I've had and sort of briefly what I've been doing. You know, I listened to an interview that you did and um, you did talk about trauma, explaining how that's associated with, you know, the loss of the language, how it creates trauma and maybe having even to have to leave and um, not be able to communicate in our native, native language for a lot of the people, especially the elderly. Um, but one thing that was so touching is the story that you shared of interv or talking to a woman in her 90s that you met, I, I don't remember where it was, uh, but you said that you, she was so fragile and so you were asking her if it's okay to ask her questions. That and, was an instability, yes. Yeah, that, and that. her reaction and she looked at you and she held, you said you, she held your hand or your wrist. I'll tell you that, I'll tell you that story. I mean, that was... Please uh, tell me because I was, you know, who I saw my mother, I saw my great aunts and I saw all the elderly in our family responding in that way. So please share that story because so yeah. to understand how powerful the healing element of this. 
Yeah, I mean, that's one of the most emotional part of sort of experiences I've had, had in this, in my field work. Because of course, you see, I've done, when I started working on these dialects about 25 years ago, I started doing field work across the whole world because I was looking at the diaspora of, of Aramaic speakers, you know, in North America, in Australia, and across Europe. Uh, but I also did some field work in the Caucasus because uh, there are a number of Aramaic speaking communities in uh, particularly Tbilisi area in Georgia. And um, there, uh, there is a, a small community, for example, of Christians who are Chaldeans actually, uh, who speak um, from the, originally from the town of Salamas in northwestern Iran. Uh, and they migrated into Tbilisi in the 19th century, a lot of them already, some of them very beginning of the 20th century. But their dialect has been, uh, it was, it's become very endangered because they have essentially mixed with people from Urmi, actually, and they, so their, their dialects are virtually extinct in its pure form. But I, I'd heard that in Georgia, there are, the, the, in, in Tbilisi, there were a few speakers left. So I, some years ago, I went to Tbilisi and I, 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 I met the head of the community there. And he said, he, as far as he knew, there were three women left who could speak the language, the dialect purely. And, uh, or three, sorry, three people. One of them had, had just had a stroke, unfortunately, a man, and he couldn't speak. So that was... He, unfortunately he'd already lost his language there was another woman who an old woman who lived alone but she had uh, she was she had a whole lot of dogs who wouldn't let kept barking so i couldn't record, record her at all she was very scared of burglars so uh but anyhow so I, I, the third person I, I i i was brought to which turned out to be the best speaker she was a a, 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 a little uh, uh, old lady about uh, you know in, in the late 90s a very small frail lady and he she i went when walking down i was taken into this large sort of a soviet style apartment block and she opened the door and she looked extra incredibly frail and we sat down at the kitchen table and she she poured some tea and her hand was shaking like this you know and she then she sat down and I, I realized, you know, she didn't have much strength. And I, 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 this is often the case that, you know, when I interview people, I realize these very old, when you're very old, you, I'm always a bit concerned about exhausting people. Um, so um, I said to her, you know, can I just ask you a few questions about, about your language? And um, I don't want to exhaust you, just, you know, just a few, just a few small questions. And, you know, she kind of this, this little hand came over and, and grabbed my wrist like this. And she looked at me in the eyes and she said, Bikir, Bikir, which in her dialect is, you know, Bakir or, you know, ask in, in her dialect. And she said, she wanted to, me to ask her everything I wanted because she wanted to tell me everything because she wanted me to preserve it for the future for the future generations, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren. She wanted me to preserve it. So, you know, after, after about sort of 20 minutes, I said, you know, is, are you tired? And she sort of, her hand kept holding my wrist and she said, ask, ask again, ask everything you want to ask. So, you know, she, we were there for about two hours. She was holding my hand and she was so, sort of, she answered all my questions, you know, she wouldn't start, you know, I was getting tired, I remember. <laughs> But um, she just, uh, at, at that moment, I felt that this, you know, this, this, this woman has come to the end of her life. She, she wanted to, to, she had a, a heritage, she had a legacy, but she didn't know who to leave it to. She didn't know how, well, she didn't know who to, it wasn't so much she didn't know how to leave it to, she didn't know how to, 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 to actually give it to her, to, the, to later generations because otherwise it would just disappear with her. So she yeah, had this know, incredible energy. The, the, when you were telling me, um, well, when I heard you talk about how um, she responded to that, it's because, you know, um, a lot of the minorities, they have um, gone through so much oppression and persecution, and most recently, you know, the massacres that have happened, the genocides. Um, so 
when there is that opportunity to be heard, it's the one, it's the opportunity that they haven't been given. And they're, they carry a lot of pain because they haven't expressed it. So sometimes you see it in their faces. You know, they're tired and there's, there's something so deep within them that goes back generations. So they're not just expressing their story, but from generations before um, that they haven't been able to, to express because of the fear. I was born in Baghdad. You know, I wasn't, um, we just visited in the villages, but I grew up even with that fear of just not saying anything, not mentioning, not asking questions. And you're not really sure what you're afraid of, but there's like this cloud of fear all over. And then and in my generation, um, this was when Saddam was coming into power. Um, it was a different thing, but then they expressed, they explained, um, went through their own like traumas from before that and before that and before that. Um, and so they went through such a, a struggle and journey to get to the United States. And so this generation for us, it's just learning how to begin to feel a little bit safe and be able to express our stories. And um, I know you mentioned even like when you talk to children, you see how the effect that has had on them. And it's true, like everything that you said, you really understand the, the depth of all of it. And I do wonder, you know, you, you mentioned you and a lot of people in the academia, they, they did notice that this was a language that wasn't really highlighted or, or looked into. I'm wondering, is there a reason for that? Do you think, like, how did that happen? Is it because of the turmoil that is in the Middle East that kind of, um, you know, had the, a lot of the academia, they didn't really pay attention to the importance of this language? Yeah, it's mainly because typically, it's certainly in, in universities, the, there's more attention to classical written languages rather than spoken languages. I mean, that's, that's the main point. I mean, so if you study so-called Semitic languages, I mean, typically students, you know, would learn the classical languages or classical Arabic, um, classical Syriac, you know, the, the sort of the Bar Hebraeus and the Pshita and things like that, uh, or, or classical Hebrew. Uh, but, you know, the spoken language, the vernacular, you know, these dialects which are not written down typically, I mean, you know, most of these Aramaic spoken dialects are not written down. I mean, that's not really a subject that is typically taught in universities. It's, it's, it's not, I think it's mainly a sort of a bias towards classical languages. That's, that's the main thing. It's nothing specific about Aramaic. But, I mean, the, the, the important point about the Aramaic dialects, as I was saying earlier, is that they go, they have their own history. It's, it's not... You know, it's not that they are somehow a descendant or some kind of corrupted form of classical Syriac. I mean, that, that is absolutely not true. I mean, it, they, they have their own history, sort of, with, and their history goes back to antiquity. So they're ancient languages, and I will say to people that ancient languages, but they are only coming into, only sort of surfacing in, in, in modern times. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 it is a sad fact that in universities, there's not so much attention being, or emphasis being put on these, well, specifically spoken Aramaic. I mean, in fact, there is no, I mean, I've tried to, I've encouraged a lot of my students to, to, to particularly doctoral students, to do uh, PhDs on the, these Aramaic dialects, too, you know, because it's, I, I myself can't do this, you know, all by myself. I mean, I need to, I need, students to help me. I've also recently been carrying out um, training native speakers of Daleks to, 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 to get involved with the documentation and I was in Iraq a couple of times over the last few years holding workshops among um, Aramaic speakers, one in Ankawa, one in Dahok for example in 2019 where I was training young, young people. I mean young people from you know Chaldean and you know, also, you know, the different Syrian, uh, Syrian, the Chaldean. But for example, in Ankawa, I had a lot of people from from the Mosul plain, from Khedidai, from Barutle, I had one person. I mean, so I was training them to how to go about things like transcription, how to record, how to transcribe. Uh, and in, in general, the importance of being aware of, of, of the antiquity of their language. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, your your work, and there are some that um, kind of like you, once they discovered, came across this, um, that there is still Aramaic speaking people, including just, I mean, like, just to give you an example, I was at the Holocaust Memorial Center um, visiting with the archivist uh, to see how, how they preserve some of their work and what they do for digital storytelling. And uh, even though Michigan has like the largest uh, community of Chaldeans in the world, she was not aware of the, of the communities here still speaking Aramaic. Um, just to give you an example, and she was so excited and, and supportive of that, but it made me also realize that how many, how few people are aware of that, even the ones that live locally. Yeah, no, it's, um, um, I would say, you know, it's the oral culture is, you know, is, is an important component in, in, in the whole process of preserving the, the language. When I say preserving, I'm talking about preserving knowledge of it. Now, you know, that's a difference from sort of reviving a language as a spoken language. I mean, I think, you know, it, it's, I, I've not, I've not really been involved in what's known as revitalization. I mean, it's because there's, you need some kind of public policy for that, you know, for revitalization. You need to have schools and teaching the language. Now, of course, I'm not, that's a sort of government led public policy type of a uh, task. But I, I, I've been really, I've decided the best thing I can do is to preserve knowledge of these dialects, make records of them, make recordings make um of them and write grammars of the languages uh you know while they are well they're still spoken well there are good speakers still left and by the way just just recording rec i mean recording somebody is very important but to really to preserve the language you need to process it you need to write a, a, what's now full grammar and dictionary <laughs> Now, you can imagine it's a massive task and there's, you know, nearly a hundred dialects. So this is a massive undertaking. But I mean, to, I mean, I myself have, and my students, we've been trying to do this over the last you know, two or more decades. And um, we are building a website where we are going to try and Yeah, I was going to ask, is there, um, you're building a website right now? Is Yeah, well, we've had one, but we're now kind of like, improving it uh, unfortunately it's a bit it's off it's not quite online yet it keeps going off and on could we but we hope within the next couple of months we'll have it up and running again where we, we're going to have upload a lots of our recordings of different villages so you may be able to click on a on a village and, 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 and but what it, do you have a name for it like if some if we want to revisit that at some point um yeah i mean i can well it's it's I don't know if you can just, just spell it out. It's, it's N, well, I can send you the chat. Do you want me to send you a chat? Okay. Yeah. Can yeah, I send I wanted it? the audience to be able, I'm also, I can put the name, um, because this is recorded right now, so I can also include it. Let me see. Uh, wait a minute. We would love to visit that. That's one thing. I mean, it sounds like you've done yeah, enormous. The, if I send this in the chat to everyone, is that right? No, you know, this is, is live right now. Um, so let me see if I can get it. Hang on. We you are. Send it to me. Yeah, you can send it to me. And then yeah, I can it it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, I see. It's kind of a longer name. I think so that's, you might find it's down at the moment, but I'm hoping certainly shortly it will be available for. Okay, so in the future, this is what we can, this would be the, in the future, this is going to be the link. Yeah. As you're building, okay. Well, we really appreciate all the work that you've done. I mean, um, however it starts, it's important that it has. It has been very helpful for us, even like I said, as we are doing our own project. I know even in the few minutes that I talked to you before the interview, you were very helpful. Um, this is a really great beginning to help to um, document. And also, who knows, I mean, the inspires revitalizing the language or at least for our children to be inspired to know that there is um, this kind of interest in the language and um, you know professors such as yourself and um, who have who are in a position to help continue this somehow or to inform people about it are 
I, I feel like once they recognize it, then they do a great, incredible job in helping document and bring awareness to it. So thank you so much for all your work. And um, we look forward, you know, to see what other works you, as we will view the link and everything like that and the videos that you post, we look forward to the work that's gonna be coming out in the future. Right, well, thank you very much, uh, we are and uh, best of luck with your own projects and your museum. Which seems thank you, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for watching. This will be recorded so you can watch this again, incredible information and we're very grateful for Dr. Khan's work for preserving the Aramaic language. Good. Okay.